to Nehemiah chapter one and the first part of chapter two. I want us to consider this evening both the importance of prayer and of action. As Christians, given our fallen natures are still very much a part of us, uh, we have a tendency to imbalance. It's always a challenge to maintain the right balance. On the one hand, there can be a form of pietism. That is, that there is a sort of devotion to spiritual things like prayer, or like the study of the scriptures and the fellowship of the Lord's people, all of which are, of course, essential and right. But a devotion that does not lead to serving Christ, as he has called us to do in this world that we are a part of. On the other hand, there can be an activism where there is much zeal for doing things, for evangelism, for outreach, for caring for people in our society. Again, all of this is, of course, right and proper. But it's done in a form of human endeavor based upon good organization and without seeking God to be at work in and through us in these things. And what we really need is a piety without pietism and activity without activism. And as we come to Nehemiah, some commentators have described him as the perfect example of a servant of the Lord, a man of prayer and a man of action in the Lord's service. And first of all, I want us to consider Nehemiah's prayer as we find it in chapter one. He's received the news of the situation in Jerusalem, the dire straits that the city is in, and the people who have returned from the exile in Babylon. Ezra, the previous book, has spoken much about the Lord bringing people out of the exile and their return to Jerusalem and the building of the temple. But now Nehemiah hears that the walls of the city are still ruined, the gates are burned, the people are still very much at the mercy of those forces that surround them and are antagonistic. And Nehemiah is overwhelmed by this news. It forces him to pray and fasting. He is conscious as he addresses great and gracious God that there is a need to see God at work. Yes, he will have the ambition, he will have the desire, no doubt God given, to do something about it. But ever before he expresses that, he expresses first of all, the need for God to be at work. He speaks of the Lord God of heaven, who is not only great 
and awesome, but is also graciously faithful and keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. His confidence is not in himself, but in the God who can do all things and the God who is well disposed towards his people. First and foremost, Nehemiah knows he must seek God's aid. Like Ezra before him in Ezra chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1, Nehemiah identifies himself with the sins of the nation. He doesn't stand aloof. He doesn't say Oh, Lord, forgive them, this people. As if in some way he was not associated with them and had no part in their sinful neglect of God. No, he identifies with them. He is humble. He is contrite, acknowledging his own contribution and the contribution of his fathers to the sins of the people. There's no arrogance here. There's no sense of him suggesting that there is some merit that he possesses that he can command God to respond to by answering his prayers. In verse 8 and 9, he recalls the promises of God. When he says, remember, he's not uh, suggesting that the Lord had forgotten what he had said. God does not forget. Other than praise his name, he's determined to forget our sins. God doesn't need to be reminded of his promise. Rather, this is an invitation for God to intervene on behalf of his people in keeping with the promise that God had made. He's relying upon God's faithfulness. He appeals to God to intervene on the basis that God himself has established a covenant with these people. They had been chosen by God. They had been redeemed from Egypt. And for God's own name's sake, Nehemiah pleads that the Lord would use his great power and strong hand to save his people once again. Nehemiah is not relying upon his own merits, upon his own persuasive powers, but on the character of God. And he therefore asked God to ensure that Artaxerxes, the king, will be favorably disposed towards him when he asks permission to go to the aid of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is sincere in his prayers. That's seen by the fact that he also fasts as he prays. And he's persistent in his prayer over a period of four months before he actually approaches Artaxerxes. Nehemiah's prayer is an example of godly humility and dependence upon the Lord, whom he trusts, the God who does answer the prayers of his people. A tale is told about a small town that had been historically dry 
alcohol was not sold anywhere within the town. There were no uh, public houses and so on. But then a local businessman decided to build a pub. A group of Christians from a local church were concerned and planned an all night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. It just so happened that shortly thereafter, lightning struck the pub and it burned to the ground. Now the owner of the pub sued the church claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible for the loss of his business. But the church hired a barrister to argue in court that they were not responsible. The presiding judge, as he reviewed the case, stated, no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The pub owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. Nehemiah believed in the God of prayer. And so should we. We need to be prayerful. Not merely presenting a list of requests before the Lord, but truly casting ourselves upon the Lord and pleading for him to intervene in our day for his name's sake. We need to cry out to the Lord to revive us, to come afresh and renew us in our spiritual fervor. We need to pray that the Lord would have mercy upon our land, upon our communities, our friends, our family. For surely we know that if the Lord does not come, then it does not matter how much we do. It does not matter how great our programs are. They will be of no effect. We need God to come. And therefore, we must pray. And to encourage ourselves, we should remind ourselves of God's goodness in the past, his mighty deeds, and his faithfulness to his promises. And it is not that we have to twist God's arm in prayer. It is not that he is reluctant to answer prayers. No. He delights to answer the prayers of his children when they are brought before him in the name of his precious son. So we need to pray. Nehemiah is also a man of action. And as we come into chapter Two, we find him taking steps to address the situation. We are not told that the Lord specifically gave him command as to what he should do. We don't know what ways in the Lord led him. All we know is the outcome of his uh, dealings with the Lord in the place of prayer. And they are given to us in chapter 2. In the spring of 445 BC, Nehemiah appears sad in the presence of Artaxerxes. Up to now, he's hidden the distress he felt at the plight of Jerusalem. And immediately Artaxerxes perceives that his trusted servant is burdened. It's clear that Nehemiah is not sick, but yet there is something wrong. 
Now Nehemiah tells us that he was the king's cup bearer. And lest we think that that was a sort of menial job, we should understand that the cup bearer was perhaps the most trusted of all the king's servants and was a close confidant and advisor to the king. So God has placed Nehemiah in a position of great influence, such is the sovereignty of God, even as he had raised up Esther to become the queen in Persia previously. So there's a close relationship between Artaxerxes and Nehemiah, and Artaxerxes knows Nehemiah well enough to be able to see that he is deeply bothered. And then we read, Nehemiah says, then I was very much afraid. Why? Why should he be afraid? Well, because he was taking a huge risk at this point for three reasons. First, to appear sad in the king's presence was against Persian etiquette and could invite punishment. To be in the presence of the king, to be one of his advisors was such an honor, it was, the, it was thought that the privilege would mean that that person would be constantly glad. Again, we see something of that in the book of Esther, in chapter 4 and verse 2, where Mordecai cannot pass through the gate into the palace because he is wearing sackcloth. He is mourning in the plight of the Jews. And it was not permitted for anyone to appear sad before the king because that implied that somehow or other being in the king's presence wasn't enough to make them glad. What's more, Nehemiah is going to ask permission to leave the king's presence for some time. Now again, to ask to leave the king's presence was treasonable. Nobody should ever want to leave the king, to leave his service in the palace, except perhaps those who wish to do him harm. And third, Nehemiah is requesting Artaxerxes to do a policy U-turn. In Ezra 4, verse 21, we read that Artaxerxes had put stop to attempts to rebuild Jerusalem. And now Nehemiah was going to ask him to change his mind, something that the kings of Persia did not do. The law of the Medes and the Persians that was impossible to change. So it was not the easiest thing to ask a ruler like Artaxerxes to change the policy. You see, Nehemiah had a lot to lose. If Artaxerxes took offense at his words, and again, we think back to Esther, chapters four and five, how Esther was so anxious about speaking to her husband, the king, lest she become the object of his disfavor. Why should Nehemiah let a concern for Jerusalem threaten his future, disturb the peace of his life? Well, Nehemiah knows that the cause of the glory of God demands, demands that he risk all. Jerusalem in tatters dishonors God. And of course, 
prohibits the fulfillment of the promise of a coming Messiah. What did his life matter in comparison? During a terrifying storm off the New England coast many years ago, the Coast Guard rescue team were called out to search for survivors from a ship that had been wrecked. Frightened by the storm's ferocity, a young member of the rescue crew said, we can't go out. We'll never get back. To this, the captain, the older, experienced captain of the team replied, we have to go out. We don't have to come back. The risk. Well, as Christians, we can be risk adverse often. We must not be foolish. We'll come to that in a moment. But we are to venture forth for God's glory, not our own, in the name of Christ, to do all that we are enabled to do by the Holy Spirit, to honor God, to be instruments in his hand for the restraining of evil, being salt and light in our world, to be the messengers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of the lost. Surely, there is nothing that we should not risk for the Lord. Whatever it is that we may lose and God is so gracious and faithful that often his people, when they do venture forth in faith, find that they lose nothing. But even if we are to lose, we can lose nothing of lasting value when compared to what Christ has won for us. In faith, we are to venture all for Christ, knowing that he is able to use us to do great things. And when we fear our sacrifice might be in vain because we are so insignificant and unlikely to make a real difference, we should remember the Lord honors the sacrifices made by his people and uses them to bring glory to his name. It's not just the well-known whom God uses. It's not just people like Nehemiah who he brings to places of influence, but you know, God is an expert at using the nobodies from nowhere to accomplish eternal glories for his name. So Nehemiah, courageous in doing what he did, makes the request, but he's not foolish. When Artaxerxes asks, for the explanation for his sadness, there are two notable things in Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah doesn't actually mention Jerusalem. He only mentions Judah after Artaxerxes asks what he wants to do. And Nehemiah speaks of the place of my father's graves as lying in ruins. Now this 
meant that the issue was personal, not political. And also, it's an appeal to Artaxerxes, <clears throat> whose culture paid a great respect for the resting places of ancestors. So Nehemiah is being very wise here in the way, if you like, he pitches his request. It's well thought out. And this wisdom is extended to the occasion on which he allows his sadness to become apparent. In verse 6, we have this, what appears to be an aside that says that the queen was present. But that tells us something, that this was a private function. For according to Persian tradition, the queen would never be present at official feasts, official gatherings. They were strictly male only. But here in the confines of a more intimate, probably, a more personal environment, Nehemiah is able to make his request. How wise he is. A wisdom which undoubtedly comes from God. A wisdom that comes out of the fellowship he has sought with God in prayer. This isn't just the wisdom of a man of this world. Nehemiah, no doubt, had many talents and abilities, but they are used of God, and God gives him wisdom in how he acts. There is great respect shown by Nehemiah for the king in verse 5. Nehemiah doesn't demand anything. And he answers the king's concern when Artaxerxes says, well, how long are you going to be away? In fact, it turns out that he's away for 12 years, although it's probable that he returned during that time. Uh, to give a report. And having gained permission, Nehemiah is not slow in taking full advantage. He requests and receives letters of authority. In verse 7, and he also is given uh, permission for timber to be supplied for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Nehemiah's conduct is exemplary. It's a balance of boldness and wisdom accompanied by a right attitude to the authority of the king. It reminds me of Matthew 10, verse 16, where Jesus sending out the disciples, tells them to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And the Lord could have given them no better example of that than Nehemiah. But of course, they had the greatest example of all before their very eyes in the Lord himself. There is no greater person of prayer than the Lord in his earthly life. There is no greater example of boldness and wisdom than the Lord in his words and in his actions. How often did his opponents fail to lay a glove on him, if I can use that expression? when they tried to trip him up about paying taxes to Caesar, how he left them floundering. 
But despite all of Nehemiah's planning, despite all that is wise in his words, Nehemiah still relied upon God. And he offers up a quick prayer when Artaxerxes asks what he requires. He'd been praying for four months. He'd been praying, but in the moment, he prays again. No doubt a brief prayer, but he turns to God because he knows that it is God's sovereign will that must be done. God's will, God's way, by God's power. I read a story of America. His wife had, after many years of marriage, not been able to bear a child. And the man and his wife eagerly prayed uh, that the Lord would bless them with a child. And in the Lord's good timing, the day arrived when the wife fell pregnant. And the man couldn't help but relay this good news to his fellow workers. And he told them that God had answered his prayers. But all they could do is make fun of him for asking God for a child. They, they thought this was somewhat ludicrous. The baby was born having been diagnosed with Down's syndrome. As the father made his way to work for the first time after the birth, he wondered how he could face his co-workers, and he prayed, God, please give me wisdom. And what he feared happened. Some mockingly said, so God gave you this child. The new father stood for a time silently asking God for help. And at last, these words came upon his lips. I'm glad the Lord gave this child to me and not to you. Relying upon the Lord, knowing the wisdom of the Lord. We must be wise in what we do for the Lord, not fearful, not hesitant, but nevertheless wise. Enthusiasm is no substitute for wisdom. And we are to ask the Lord to grant us the wisdom we need to serve him effectively. And we are not to rely upon our own wisdom or the resources of others, we must always be found turning to the Lord in prayer. Don't have to be long prayers. They don't have to be prolonged seasons of prayer, although those can be especially blessed. In every situation, we can pray for help. That's why, as a Christian institute, we covet the prayers of the Lord's people. We covet them because we know we're dependent upon God in all things. And we have need of the wisdom that only God alone can give. We may have experience. We, I have colleagues who are very experienced in all manner of fields and uh, are greatly talented by God's 
grace in what they, they do, but we cannot rely upon ourselves and upon our own expertise. We must rely upon God. And we must rely upon God because ultimately it's not about us. It's about him. It's about the honor of his name. And what is true for us in the Christian Institute is true for all believers of all churches. We're not exceptional. We're not unique. We are but the Lord's servants, as all of his people are. And the wisdom that God alone can give is essential for those who would serve him well as they seek him in prayer. Even as we see in the example of Nehemiah, but see even more clearly in the greater example of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord make us Christ-like in all our ways. But may he particularly Make us people of prayer, people of action, not one without the other, but both. May the Lord bless you and encourage you in your service for him as a congregation and as individuals, wherever he has called you to serve him. Amen.